Good afternoon, Circle City Con. Welcome to track three. We're getting this afternoon started with Ryan Wisnowski. Ryan is an information security professional focused on security program implementation and transformation for both small and large scale organizations. He's coming to you with Zero Day to Hero Day, surviving an attack and establishing a security organization. With that, I'm gonna hand this over to Ryan. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone that's sticking around um, Sunday after lunch. It's it's a tough speaking opportunity, but um, we're going to get um, started here. Um, I appreciate everybody sticking around. Um, we got a really good talk coming up here. Um, just before we get started, the virtual thing is a little bit new for me. Uh, this talk is usually highly interactive, so we are going to be doing things a little bit differently. I know that um, a lot of people grew up with Sesame Street or Dora the Explorer or something like that. So we're gonna try this out. Um, I'm gonna ask, what color is this ball? And I expect all of you at home to be screaming out, red. I say, yes, it's red. So we're just gonna try that a little bit here. Um, Q&A will be at the end. We're gonna transition that over to the Discord channels. I'll be hanging out in one of the voice channels if you wanna talk. Otherwise, we'll be doing everything in track three um, via text. So with that out of the way, um, welcome to Zero Day to Hero Day, Surviving Attack and Establishing a Security Organization. Um, CircleCityCon 7.0, um, 2020 edition, Apocalypse, it's very fitting. Um, just thank you to everyone that's uh, making this uh, possible, working behind the scenes. They're working their tails off. So big round of applause to everybody out there trying to make this possible. Um, socials are down there. If you want to download the slide deck, I think I have a version up there on uh, slideshare.net. You can find all the other talks as well. Um, you can also find my GitHub. I know I have a repo up there. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, DMs are open. Feel free to reach out after the talk. So um, here we go. First interactions. So how many people out there are red teamers? We got a few of them, okay. Uh, blue teamers, a little bit more. And then um, how about the people that don't identify with a color because you do absolutely everything in your organization. You are the IT janitor, you are the security lead, you are the response um, person, you also take out the garbage for the office, right? Yeah, those are my people, that's who I'm looking for. So I'm gonna start off with who this talk is not uh, for. This talk is not for people that think they have a, a mature security organization that know that incident response is a um, lockstep uh, procedure where if something happens, they know exactly what they're doing. These are not talks for people that understand that they have a automated DR process to make sure um, systems are available all the time. Who this talk is for is for people um, that do everything and know that when it hits the fan, they're gonna be working some really long hours. So I wanna make those long hours a little less impactful on your life. And hopefully you learn a thing or two, um, just kind of going through pro tips and stuff through incident response. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna be telling a lot of um, anecdotes. Um, everything has been scrubbed to protect the incident or guilty, depending on how you think about these people. Um, these are real life situations. So these are small businesses, they're schools, they're charities, um, governments. Uh, these are everybody with underfunded IT where everybody's stretched super thin. Um, if you have an underfunded IT staff, there's no way you have a functioning security organization. So these, these situations are real. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, not pet you. When I started talking about this, um, 2017, one of the biggest financial impacts of a cyber attack, where it was $10 billion, it's probably been adjusted since then, um, but there was a huge impact of the not pet you um, attack. So, and it's still happening today, um, just through the news. Um, June 11th, whenever that was, it was just this week, we found that a nation state actor deployed multi-stage ransomware on critical infrastructure. Luckily, it was a honeypot this time. Maybe it's not a honeypot next time. Uh, Knoxville had to shut down part of its network because they were hit by ransomware. So this stuff is still happening. Um, you know, as we start talking about it and we stopped romanticizing ransomware, it's just kind of fallen into a normal operation. So what I want to do is take you through a little bit of a hypothetical situation. We know what hypothetical means in our business. It means I'm under NDA. Right, so everything's been scrubbed and generalized, but these lessons learned apply to everybody because I haven't seen a snowflake example yet where it's, oh, this is really unique. We gotta do something different. So we get a text message. It's late at night from our pointy hair boss. Hey, can you take a look at the network? There's a lot of things down, um, take a look. So we log into a server and we get presented this. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it's, you know, a text file. Maybe it's this one. Does everybody know what this one was? Yeah, WannaCry. This was WannaCry. 
maybe it's just this one. Maybe they just DD null right over your hard drives. Now you have nothing. It's a total devastation, right? So what do we do? What are we looking to do right now as security professionals? That's right. We're looking for instant response. Where's the playbooks? What are we doing? Well, okay. So yeah, we're parachuting into a place and we're talking to people We're like, yeah, incident response. We used to do these executive tabletops. They cost us a lot of money. The executives really didn't understand what we we're trying to do. They got frustrated. Um, so we just kind of dropped the incident response program. We know it's important, but we, we didn't have any incidents before this. Okay. Well, let's talk about disaster recovery then. So now we need to rebuild this place. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Disaster recovery. We have that. Um, Jim, the DBA runs these every year. Like, cool. Can we see these procedures? Oh, yeah, let's. Uh, oh, no. Uh, yes. Well, Jim retired five years ago. We haven't done it since then. And um, yeah, we're not sure where Jim lives anymore. He's retired in somewhere in a beach. Oh, OK, um, do we have system documentation? Do we have anybody that can tell me how the systems were built? Uh, well, remember, Jim? Oh, OK, OK, I, I, I get where we're going on this one, right? So here we go. Lesson one, uh, we're going to cover two lessons today. So lesson one is going to be recovery from scorched earth. Um, at this point, we are sitting in a dumpster fire, right? We're going to start by taking a deep breath. Um, this is going to be painful. This is going to be difficult. This is going to stretch every skill that you have. Um, so I stole two quotes from our uh, military branches here in the United States. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You don't have time to screw up your recovery efforts. You don't have time for a reinfection and you don't have time to actually debate anything here. You need to move quickly and move with precision. A lot of people are gonna be counting on you. Um, in a couple of different places that I've been working, it was, if we don't get the business back up in five days, we're done, we're closing shop. There's gonna be 3000 people out of work. Um, like this is real stuff, this is, this is dangerous. So you need to move with precision. You need to know exactly what you do. Don't screw it up. Number two is embrace the suck. Like I said, this is going to be awful. This is going to be one of your worst life experiences ever. If you're not in incident response used to this stuff, this is going to seem like the worst thing that could ever happen to you. You're going to be working long hours. You're going to be 36, 48 hours without sleep. You're going to be running around like crazy man or woman. Um, it's bad, right? But if we get through this, like... A perfect example, right? The um, virtual cons, we got through it. This is kind of what we do in security. We look at adversity and we look at these problems and we just problem solve, right? So embrace it. Then you get a cool story that you can maybe talk at Circle City Con 80 when we come back next year. I slipped this one in actually after I started talking about this because I found out a lot of people don't know this. Um, have your legal team sign off on the incident response um, retainer or the hiring. Make sure your legal team is involved because um, there's going to be a lot of communications going around. There's going to be a lot of evidence. You want that stuff to be under client privilege and keep, um, keep confidential because you never know in a couple of years when you're going to have a lawsuit or a subpoena or something where they're going to ask for evidence that you just don't have because they were decimated in the attack. Have your legal team have all this stuff in privilege um, to kind of maintain a composure of what's discoverable in court and what's not. They're going to be the experts in this field. Keep them involved. Um, they're not going to be running your incident response meetings. However, you want to have all the communications to the world going through them. So we took our deep breath. We got our legal team. Step one, we got to stabilize this patient. We have a person bleeding out on the table. We need to figure out exactly what's going on. So you'll hear me ask a lot of questions. It's always about the questions um, to drive the right answers, right? So what do we know? How do we stop this from getting worse? And then how do we make sure that we don't make it worse? So let's look at what we know. Um, yes, I know this looks like your architecture. It's not your architecture. This is everybody's architecture. This is just where we're at today in IT. Everybody has this legacy Windows environment because we're all moving to the cloud, but there's a lot of stuff that we haven't figured out how to move up there for reasons X, Y, and Z. So we have this legacy Windows environment. And then even before Windows, we have this legacy ERP system, right? So it's probably like an AS400, a power series, something like that, that we're not moving our business core services off of just yet because we're trying to figure out the best way to do this and we haven't figured out how to justify it yet. Got all these laptops and desktops that we call clients, and everything, of course, is connected to the internet because that's how the world works. So let's lay out where we sit now after this attack. So the on-premise Windows environment is decimated. 
um, everything's impacted there. We see C2 traffic going out to the internet from our server environment and our workstation uh, environment. Not all clients are impacted. There's something strange going on, but um, we're not exactly sure what it is, but we do see some are working, some aren't, but we do see them starting to spread. So not sure exactly what's going on there. We know it's a flat network because if it wasn't a flat network, we wouldn't be in this situation. The legacy stuff seems okay, so does the cloud. So it seems like everything outside of our Windows environment, it's, it's okay, it's still chugging along. So interaction point, what do we wanna do? So shout out, what do we wanna do at this point right now? Yes, I heard we could kill the internet. Well, if we kill the internet, we're probably gonna take down business, right? Um, we're gonna stop our B2B traffic. We're gonna stop any orders processing and that stuff. Um, what if we just powered down the data center? That would stop the fraud. But we might corrupt data. We might have transactions in play. And we know that we haven't done DR in the uh, last five years. We're not sure if the databases can actually replay all the transactions. So we might corrupt an order database, something like that. The point of this is let's list out all of our actions on what we can do. So then we have at least a starting point to start thinking about how we're going to go about this. So like, for example, we could try to find this malware. Do we have a forensics expert online? Probably not. Uh, we can hire that out, but is that the best place to be put in our efforts right now? If we find the malware, it might take a, lot, a long time. Like I said, if we disconnect the internet, we're probably bringing down the business. We could disable users. We know that users are compromised. We're not sure which ones. Should we disable some of them? Should we disable all of them? List out all of these actions that you can think of and then list all the negative outcomes that happen and try to figure out to your best of ability, because you're gonna have to do this quick, which ones do you wanna do? So like I said, we could power down everything and corrupt databases, it might happen. We might be able to recover, we might not. Once you have all these listed out, make your decisions and move. This is usually what we do. So we're gonna disable routing between the environments. Log on your core switches, kill off anything that's, um, you know, depending on your network architecture, make sure that your environments are at least isolated so you can't, you're, you're containing the spread at that point. Disable all your domain accounts. If you have domain accounts that are compromised, chances are they got a domain admin account and your entire domain needs to be burned. Send people home. Um, this is an interesting one because when you take away all the computers, anybody that's not essential to the recovery or the, um, continuing operations, send them home. Um, there's gonna be a lot of people that wanna help, but they're not gonna be able to help. So they're gonna just kind of get in the way. Their, their intentions are good. They just don't have the skills or capabilities to help. Send them home. Um, side note, there's something funny that happens. Uh, a rumor mill will begin, I guarantee it, when you have a cybersecurity attack and you're sending people home as you recover the business. I can't tell you how many times I've heard something like, oh, the Chinese or the Russian or whatever hot in the news, right? Like, oh, yeah, we saw a guy come in. He looked really Russian. Do you think he was the attacker? It's like, no, it wasn't George from accounting. I guarantee it. It's because we had RDP open to the world. It was definitely not the guy coming into our office and planting something. It doesn't happen like that, right? Last step is um, number four, uh, get management to figure out your BCP. So notice I didn't say DR, it's BCP. How do we continue as a business without technology? We're gonna have to get creative here, but let management figure that out while you're doing all the recovery efforts. What this results in is an isolated area of an investigation and recovery, right? So you're going to have to prioritize a lot of your work. This gives you at least a starting point of, okay, we have this environment, this environment, and this environment, and you can start focusing into areas. So cool. We turned off our core routers. We brought down the business. Start the clock. Does everyone out there know how long their business can stay down without declaring bankruptcy or making drastic changes to the business? If you don't, let's get some homework out there and let's talk to the business to figure out exactly how long. A good starting point I always recommend is two weeks, especially if it's Fridays. Because what happens every two weeks in most businesses, it's payday. So if you can't pay your employees, chances are you're gonna have big problems getting them come back. Okay? So at very, very least, it's probably around two weeks. It's probably a lot closer to maybe three, four days of full production. It's going to vary depending on the business and risk models and everything like that. Ask, ask the business, ask your senior leadership, how long can we keep this business down? It's a good conversation to have now rather than when you're on fire. So cool. 
business is done. What's the next step? So we got to figure out how we're going to fix this place, right? So we first have to know what's broken. How bad is it? What do we need to fix? And what do we need to fix first? So what's broken? That's the first question that we got to ask ourselves. Be careful with this. This question makes sense to you and me. This question is very dangerous when you ask other people. We think like, yeah, we need to know what's broken so we know what to fix. This is what the answer you get though when you talk to somebody in this situation. It's bad, right? Everything's down. We can't even talk to people. Like that's not useful. Um, I did sneak out a video from one of my clients um, in the boardroom when we asked this question accidentally uh, before I changed up my tack a little bit. This is exactly what they looked like, right? So it's, it's not a good question. Don't ask that. Turn the phrase a little bit to something that is useful to management. What do we need to do to stay in business? That's a much better question. That's something that they can chew on. They're going to go away and they're going to come back with their answer. And it's going to look something like this. It's going to vary um, business to business, uh, service versus production, manufacturing kind of thing. But it's going to be something like this. We take in requests. We do something to fill the request. We receive payments and we pay bills. That's the business cycle. That's how businesses work. So cool. We know how we make money now. How do we do those things from a technology standpoint? So red teamers in the room, this is where you come into play. We are on a black box pen test, basically. Blue teamers in the room, if you don't know how to run an Nmap scam, figure it out. Um, go take any type of very basic intro to enumerations um, and just get this in your uh, tool belt. Because at this point, we're not sure how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We have no system documentation. We have nothing. Things are kind of running. We need to know what's talking to what. What should be talking to what? What service do we have? Go find any information that you can find from anywhere, right? We're talking about any documentation that you can pull up, network logs, run your Nmap scans, right? We're looking at system configurations. Pull out the microfish. Um, who here has worked in a data center with a raised floor? Grab the suction cups, pull off the tiles, see underneath the floor if there's any documentation. No joke, found a DR um, a whole binder right under the floor. It was sitting there for three years. It was actually pretty useful because the critical services, here's a, here's a pro tip. So if you want to find the most critical service in your business, find the system that is not patched. Everybody's afraid to bring it down. They're afraid to touch it. That is probably the most critical server. So documentation from three to five years ago, probably really similar to the current config, right? Grab anything that you could find, put that up on a whiteboard. What we want to do is figure out how these things are interacting with each other. What is doing what? What do we need to go do our business cycle? And what you'll end up with is an architecture. And you're like, oh, I'm starting to understand it. It's kind of like one of those optical illusion pictures where you stare at it for a long time and eventually the picture just jumps out at you. This is what's going to happen. The problem is this is what it's going to look like to you in your head. This is what it, you look like to everybody else in your organization. You are a crazy person, right? You're the madman. So we need to organize these thoughts in a little bit. Another business pro tip. If you want anything done, put it in a spreadsheet. So now we know what our critical functions are, right? We need to take orders. We need to make products, blah, blah, blah. And we know what systems we need to do those critical functions. Then we're going to list out the various steps of our restore. And then we're going to color code it. Why do we color code it? So management knows if it's good or bad. What we want to do is limit the amount of interaction that is required from us to management. Our job is to focus on recoveries, not on communications. The worst thing that could happen is you have an executive breathing down your deck, asking, why is it not done? Why is it not done? Why is it not done? And all you do is spend time doing status updates. If you have this type of leadership, make sure you assign somebody to be the communications lead that is collecting all this information and managing that. Something that we've done in the past is get this recovery matrix up on a TV or a projector and put it outside of your war room. So if people are curious on the status, they can walk by and they say green or red. They know what's working, what's not. As things go more green, they know you're making progress. It's a very easy way to keep yourself isolated to your work and everybody else is informed. So how do we restore this now? So back to the technicals. So we know we have a whole bunch of systems that are down and we need to bring them back. Going back to step zero and breathing and thinking through this, we cannot risk a reinfection. 
So we're going to restore to a quarantine zone. <laughs> so we know we have a backup system. We're going to connect it to the quarantine zone, and we're going to then restore to a new network. There's one problem with this diagram. I told you that the most critical systems aren't touched and they're not patched and they're probably susceptible to the same thing. That includes your backup system. Backup systems that are online, chances are, are running legacy code because nobody wants to update them. They're going to be affected as well. All your online backup systems are most likely going to be affected by the ransomware or the destruction attack. So <clears throat> now what do we do? That's right. We go to offline backups. We go to our tape. Now, tape is a naughty word in IT because it's old and slow. So I will replace tape with offline backups. If your backups, if you have like a three node backup system where you have an active, active, passive, and they're online, they are susceptible to destruction attacks. You need to make sure to have offline backups. So if you don't have offline backups, here's some more homework. Go talk to um, your IT organization and figure out why you don't have offline backups and present this use case to them. So we are going to build a new backup system and we're going to rebuild our backup catalog from our tapes, from our offline disk, from whatever we have. And then we're going to move into the quarantine system. So what do we need in a quarantine to make sure that what we're restoring is not infected? Yep, I heard air gaps. I heard monitoring and alerting, right? So we need to understand exactly what's happening in there. So this thing is air gapped. And I don't mean air gapped in network segmentation. I mean air gapped, air gapped. This is going into a different rack. This has no communications outside. If you have pizza box servers, you are physically moving them. We cannot risk a reinfection. Company is gone if we get reinfected at this point because you're probably 72, 96 hours into the incident right now and you're starting finally to make progress. If you kneecap your progress with an infected system into your new network, you have to restart the clock again. And if you're going on day five, day six of bringing back the business, you have to restart from day zero and you might have just lost your chance to save this company. So we are doing this the right way. We are air gapped. We're going to monitor for IOAs and IOCs, indicators of attacks, indicators of compromise. Make sure that you have a clean system and clean data before you move into a new network. So notice I keep saying new network, not production. This is because another cool thing happens. When you have a B word in your environment, all of a sudden the security budget goes out the window and you have a blank check. Now that blank check expires in about 90 days when everybody forgets about security and then you have to go fight tooth and nail for your budget again. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But right now we have a blank check. We have authorization to do whatever we want. No change control, no nothing because the business is down, right? So what do we want in our new network? Okay, IAM. IAM is a good example, right? So we can do role-based access controls, right? We can make sure that Sally Mae in accounting doesn't have access to the payroll systems, um, you know, the data to manipulate social security numbers and that stuff. We can isolate there. It, it might take a long time, but we could do that. Um, yes, network segmentation. Perfect example. So network segmentation would help us because if the uh, adversaries come back, and they will, they will have less of an impact on the next compromise. How are we gonna know about the next compromise? We're gonna have monitoring and alerting systems. Go grab a log aggregation in a SIM or something like that. You, it doesn't need to be world-class. It needs to be something. What about our domain? We know the domain was popped. They spread everywhere using a domain admin account that was probably your backup service account or something like that, right? So how do we trust this domain? Was the domain set up securely in the first place? What if we just burned the domain, stood up a new domain? We could do things the right way because we're going to bring this system back up incrementally so we can do things the right way. Burn the domain, stand up a new domain. So here's another couple other things, right? Firewalls. Don't think of your old ASA as a firewall. We need layer seven now. That's great you have port 53 open to the world. Um, the data is being encrypted and exfilled over for, uh, port 53 though. You're not gonna see that on an old school firewall. Get layer seven in there. You're most likely in this situation because you forgot to patch, go get a patch management. 
Give vulnerability scanners. Understand where your problems are. Like I said, the adversaries will come back. How many of you have kids out there? If you give a kid a toy and then take the toy away, that's the only thing the kid is going to focus on is getting that toy back. <clears throat> well, we just took away a toy from the adversary. They want their toy back. They are coming back. Be prepared next time. Get an IR toolkit, an EDR solution, something like that. Get it deployed in your environment. Proxies, right? Filter out all of your uh, outbound traffic through a proxy. Make sure people aren't going to malicious stuff. Make sure they're not receiving malicious emails. Make sure that you have some type of email protection. You'll notice that we're talking about the fundamentals of a security org, right? You're going to have to work hard on this. Get this in as best as possible before you turn the business back on. You're going to have a long road ahead of you, but get the fundamentals in while the business is down, while you have that blink check. So when the adversaries do come back in two to three weeks, you can, you know, you can stand a chance against them. <clears throat> so we kind of had a plan now. We're starting to bring the business back up. When do we stop? And this is an important thing because we're going to be working our tails off, no sleep. When can we stop doing it? So there's a few criteria you can talk about. Can you perform your critical functions? Can the business operate? How much longer can you keep the business down? Maybe the business can stay down an extra two days and you can put the SIM in before you turn the business back up. Maybe the business is 30 minutes away. You need to turn it on right now. And the best you could do is um, firewall off the production from the QA systems. Fine. Understand your constraints from a business and then personally too. How much can you do without sleep? <clears throat> you can't. You can't afford a mistake. How much like sleep de deprivation is a real thing. Think about that. Think about all your constraints and then define the point on, yes, we can move to a phase two of recovery. Define these conditions ahead of time so you're not doing it in there. Excellent. We have the business coming up. We hold our lessons learned. Here's um, a couple things that we found that was kind of miscellaneous outside of technical stuff. Three, two, one rule of conferences maintain in this incident. Three hours of sleep, two meals a day, one shower. Try to do that as best as possible. Your raw room will smell terrible. You're going to have three-day-old chicken nuggets over in the corner. You're going to have empty coffee cups all over the place. Um, you know, we uh, already used Jim. How about John? John over in IT spilt a whole thing of barbecue sauce on the table. We haven't cleaned that up yet. It's going to smell awful. On that note, assign a war room manager. Have somebody managing the food orders all of the documentation collection, um, the, the scheduling. This person needs to be a master organizer and a master coordinator. Have somebody taking care of this stuff so you can focus on your work. Save absolutely everything. Hard drives are cheap. Go to Best Buy, buy all of them. Um, save everything that you can. Pull off all the images. You're never um, certain during the incident what you're gonna need three months, um, you know, six months, nine months in the future. Save everything, disk is cheap. And last part here, ensure, ensure the uh, secure out-of-bands communications. The last thing you want to do is bring up the business. You didn't rebuild Exchange. The adversary has hooks in Exchange, and you're sending new credentials over. And then at that point, you get compromised again. Don't do that. Ensure that you have a plan to get out-of-band of your corporate communications. Cool. We got the business back. It was rough. So how do I never do that again? I never, never, never want to be in that situation again. Well, we're going to kind of talk about where we're weak and how do we prioritize. We kind of know where we're weak because we probably plug that gap. But how do we figure out where else we're weak, right? We're going to do a gap analysis. We're going to figure out exactly where we are. We're going to define reality. We're going to talk about what all of our problems are. Then we're going to define where we want to be. This is where we need to be from a business standpoint. This is where we're at. We're going to roadmap how do we get there. We're going to go from crawling to walking to running to becoming that Olympic athlete. Here's the steps that we need to do it. That's our jobs as security professionals to define all that work out and explain exactly what this is going to do for the business. So we know where we're at. We just rebuilt everything. We're, we're, we're at stage zero. Where do we want to be? Don't think too hard about this one. Go steal somebody's framework. These people are paid to think about this stuff and develop digestible um, information. 
digestible, I'll put in quotes because some of these documents are really, really tough to get through. Um, so I've done a little bit of legwork for you. I have this published out on uh, the Active Defense uh, website. If you want source code, just come on um, and talk to me. I have it in Visio and uh, Adobe. So just send me a DM, however you would like. I can get this over to you so you can um, tweak it to whatever you need. But essentially, this is NIST 853 broken out to a one page, very simple to understand framework. So there's statements in here called change control processes are in place. Now, if you go to NIST, that's like three paragraphs. This is my framework is very easy to understand. That's what you need to get in front of your management, in front of your executives. The higher you go up in the chain, the less time you have to interact with them. You need to distill this to the absolute fundamentals on what you're talking about. So we're going to list out all of our controls. We'll zoom up on one of these. So we're going to list out on all these controls. And then we're going to select where we think we need to be for the business. So physical devices are inventory. That's an example of a control statement. On the le top left, you see that the IT organization is going to own this. <clears throat> and on the right, uh, the top right, you have asset management. That's going to be the security portfolio that's governing this control. Down at the bottom, we have one through five. Uh, anybody that has their CISP or been through any management training, you know this as the CMMI. This is a very simple way to judge where you're at, where you want to be, and then kind of give management something to chew on. So if we're at a two and we want to get to a three, what we need to do is implement it to improve from a two to a three, it'll be $80,000. Now your management doesn't have to think about the technicals. They think about the numbers and they have something to justify to others that are outside of our scope. Um, the pro tip here is don't make everything a five. You will be spending more money than you should be if you make everything a five. Every dollar spent on security is a dollar not spent on the business, making more money, right? So we are a cost center unless we're selling security, right? But for the most part, we're a cost center. We want to be able to be responsible with the investor's money. It's not to say that we go really cheap on everything. It's we do what makes sense. So if we're at a zero, let's say, um, oh, real quick, if you haven't seen the CMMI, this is kind of what it looks like. And again, it's a whole bunch of words. I kind of distill these down into a simple question. So you have um, one through five, ad hoc, repeatable, defined, managed, and optimized. One is an ad hoc process. So does personal judgment determine the outcome? If yes, you're at a one. Number two is repeatable. Like we know what we need to do as a team. It's not, the, it's not documented anymore. We don't have a process, but we know what we're going for. And if I ask two people, they would probably do the same thing, um, you know, without any judgment coming in. Number three is the fine process, right? I can give this to a team and everybody's going to get the exact same outcome. Number four is there is something governing this process and we have exception management in place. So systems are running well. If something goes out of the normal, we know that. And then we react to it. Number five is continue improvement. Right. So that's your CMMI, the capability maturity model. And you're going to go through and rate all these. So we know we're at zero. We don't have asset management right now. So we're off the charts. We need to figure out something. We think a defined process is a good, you know, first step into this. So how do we go from a zero to a three? Well, we're going to have an asset management program and we're going to implement a system to track assets in the environment, both physically and logically, right? We're going, to, we're going to find out when we purchase it, we're going to have all the quotes in there. And then to the final point on when we dispose of it and we sell it off, um, we're going to manage that entire area and we're going to have the documentation, we're going to have IDs, we're going to have model numbers, support dates, all that stuff in here. And we believe that if we do this successfully, we will be at a three. So we're going to go do that for every single control chart. And what we're going to end up with is we're going to be like, ooh, we can see these six controls can be met by this one project. And we start organizing stuff based on this. And what you end up with is a project portfolio. Here's a couple of examples, right? You're going to have asset management. You got IAM. You're going to have incident response. But what you're going to do is have all of this work laid out for you so you can start divvying it out to other teams so they can go tackle it. But you say, Rai Wiz, there is a bunch of work here. What, what do we do first? So this is where threat modeling kind of comes in, right? So 
threat modeling to us, you know, we have all these different diagrams. We have entity relationships, we have cause effect, we have fish bones. We can go through and start defining all these things out. We can look at the diagram of geopolitical relations in the Middle East and uh, we just got popped by MS-1710. We just got popped by 0867. We are not ready to talk about geopolitical relationships, right? Make it simple. There are bad things that can happen. We have controls in place to stop those bad things from happening. And we have things that we're trying to protect. Just start here, keep it simple. So textbooks will tell you on how to prioritize all your stuff is loss expectancy. You put the likelihood and the impact, you multiply them together and you get this number called loss expectancy. If you graph these out on XYs, the top right are things that you need to mitigate because these things have a high likelihood of occurring and it's gonna hurt you as a business. So those are the things that you should do. The problem with this model that I have is it does not take into con um, consideration any resource constraints that you might have. Chances are, if we're in these situations, we have resource constraints. We can't go tackle $300 million of security budget right now, right? Like it's not happening. So what I like to do is take this one step further and call it bang for buck. So we take that loss expectancy number that we had and we put that on the Y axis, but we implement a new X axis called ease of implementation. Now what you get is stuff that is super simple to fix, that is high value to the business, that's up in the top right is a no brainer project. These are things like LAPS. Does everybody know what LAPS is? LAPS is local admin password solution. It's provided by Microsoft. And what it is, is kind of a centralized management point for all of your local admin on all of your devices. They can be workstations, servers. And um, so like, if you don't have this, chances are you have company A 2020 exclamation as your local admin account on every single one of your laptops. And because your help desk team needs access to all of them, they don't really get rotated. So maybe it's not 2020, maybe it's 2016, last time it was set, right? So what LAPS does is it has a um, hook onto all of your um, systems and it will automatically rotate this password for you every time. You have central management. So your help desk or your sysadmins can log into a portal and it spits out the um, unique password. So now if a laptop gets compromised and they have local admin, they still are subjected to, to that one asset. They don't have local admin across your fleet. So that's a no brainer. Um, if you need help with it, DM me. It's like three PowerShell commands in a, um, it commits a schema change and then you push a GPO. Super simple. You can do your whole impact analysis, get the support done within eight hours. No problem whatsoever. That's a no brainer. Top left is big projects. These are things like zero trust architectures. You know it's going to be super difficult, but if you can get them done, the mitigations are huge. Bottom right, it's the one we have times. They're easy to do. They're not that big of a deal. It's cleanup efforts, right? So that's cool. And then the bottom left are things that we're just going to do, right? These things are really hard to do and they don't provide much business to us. So now we have some type of structure to start talking about priorities. So cool, we list these all out, we prioritize. Now go do it. Um, start working through your punch list, right? We're gonna obtain the resources to complete projects. Who do you need? What do you need, right? We're gonna get the budget for any new implementation. And then we're gonna start talking about how do we make progress on all this? Uh, maybe we meet bi-weekly with the, the project teams and we're gonna meet quarterly with our steering committee. Um, steering committee is made up of your executive leadership. Um, they have a stake in security, but they don't know the technical details, right? But they should really have an input into what you want to do first from a risk management perspective. We're gonna reprioritize our projects based on business change, climate change, threat landscapes. And we're gonna continue our gap analysis. We're gonna figure out where else are we weak or where else do we wanna improve? We wanna be really good at response because we know we can't do anything um, to protect this specific attack. Or maybe it's, we don't have time to respond to everything. We need to do the best we can with protection and then go get an incident response retainer to manage anything that gets through, right? These are all decisions that you need to make and you're gonna continue these analysis through. And uh-oh, Congratulations, we're, you're, you're a CISO, right? Like we've accidentally became the security leader in the business. Um, it's not a bad thing, right? 
poor Harold here, he's not sure yet, but it's a good thing, right? We are leaders in the security organizations. We are leaders in the business. We are the trusted advisor because we can explain things because we're keeping it simple because we're relating it back, right? Um, so all these things are really, really good and they're very, very stressful. But with a couple of these tips and just trying to understand exactly what we need to do, why we need to do it, asking the right questions to get the right answers, we can get through whatever we need to. So um, congratulations, everybody has been promoted to a CISO. Um, sorry, there's no pay raises, there's no corporate jets. Um, we live in trying times, yada, yada, yada. I can't do any of that for you, but you are responsible for everything. So thank you everyone for listening to this talk. Um, like I said, these are usually really interactive and we have long discussions afterwards. Um, I really want to continue this talk into the QA channels. I'll hang out in um, one of the HallwayCon um, voice channels. Come see me out there. Otherwise, I will also be watching the text channel in track three. So thank you, everybody, for my your time. Here's my socials. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm here for you, um, whether it's about security implementations, whether it's about technical details, how to scan memory forensics. Um, if you want to talk beer, I like beer. If you want to talk whiskey, if you want to talk video games, if you want to talk anything, please reach out to me. Um, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of the con. See you guys around when we're allowed to see each other again. Thank you.